Thank you so much for joining us. Um, can you explain what you're trying to do with this new um, HOPE clinical trial? Sure. So um, my whole career, I've invented seven pharmaceuticals that are FDA approved. So I, I sort of like big problems. And as this began in December and January, this, this became sort of the biggest problem I've seen in my, in my medical career because I wasn't around in 1918. So began to, to study the virus and figure out why it's so infective, why it's, it, 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 hurt, it hurts people so quickly. Um, and a little serendipity happened. There was a, uh, so this is the seventh coronavirus we've, we have, uh, and it's the first one to have acquired something called a, a polybasic cleavage site. Um, basically, so that's three positively charged amino acids in a little, in a, in a section with only four or five amino acids. So it's, it's, it's like a beacon on the surface of the, of the spike protein that's involved in infectivity. No other coronavirus uh, has that. It acquired it from a, from probably another, there are many, many other viruses that have them. Uh, I, my operating theory is that some poor fellow in uh, China had two viral infections at the same time, and the viruses got together and exchanged some DNA, and, 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 that's, and that's how this, this arose. The serendipity has to do with the fact that when I was teaching at Stanford for about 10 years, uh, I was studying the active ingredient in bee venom. Uh, which you know, which causes stings and can actually you know kill you if uh, if you're uh, allergic to it. It also has a, a polybasic site. So I spent five years studying the properties of these, and they're it's, they're very unusual amino acids, a very unusual structure. Um, when I saw that, I knew from my five years' experience exactly what I needed to do to sort of wrap up the problem. To you know, as I as I like to say, it's it's like you know your two year old is put peanut butter on your car keys and you're late for work and you're out to the car and you look at your keys and you're not going to get in the car. That's what heparin and uh, N-acyl cysteine do uh, to the surface of the coronavirus. When do you expect to get your clinical uh, trial up and running? So we've, we've, uh, we've just begun with protocol writing and, and, and the like. Um, we'd like to start within 30 days, obviously. Um, the settings, there's three, there's three potential settings long-term for the use of this. I'm not sure which one we'll start in, but the first setting is asymptomatic people who are positive by the swab, the swab test. We know that 80% of them uh, will, within two or three or four days, begin to have symptoms, begin to have respiratory issues. So getting in, intervening at that point uh, it would be wonderful to see if you could if they never got symptoms and you'd know fairly quickly because uh, as I said the, the the time between the viral positivity and fever or uh, shortness of breath is 48 to 72 hours second setting is someone who's you know you know eight days beyond that they really they've got a good infection going and they end up being hospitalized they they're brought into the hospital and initial initially they do non ventilator respiratory support but again, uh, the, the patients who are going to progress do, quick, do so quickly. And so giving those patients, so they've come into the hospital, they're hospitalized, but they're not on a ventilator and try to keep them off the ventilator. <clears throat> uh, and then finally, the, the most difficult, challenging patients are those that are on the ventilator. Uh, one of the things about this virus is it doesn't just attack the lungs, of course. It, it attacks anything with this ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor on its surface. So that's lung, heart, vessels, kidneys. Um, so typically a, a patient in, in, uh, in intensive care on a ventilator, we'll, we, can, we can perhaps prevent, slow the infection in the lungs, but they're, they're, they, at that point they have polyorgan system, uh, system failure. Uh, but it's still obviously very attractive because they're sort of one step from death. So those are the three areas we're, we're focusing on, talking to clinical sites around the country that do infectious disease trials to see which of them they, they think is, is most, uh, most impactful. And the key here for you, the goal is to get people off of uh, ventilators, correct? No, my goal is slightly, slightly higher than that, is to keep them out of the hospital. So my vision is that a person who wants to get tested goes to a doctor's office or a pharmacy, someplace far from a, from a hospital, <clears throat> has a swab test that takes five or 10 minutes. If they're positive, they will walk out with a little kit that has perhaps a one-use nebula, one nebulizer, so it's inexpensive, a week's worth of drug. Uh, they, and they said, you know, go home, take this uh, according to the instructions that will work out in the clinical trials, and you may never have any symptoms. 
That's my goal, keeping people away from the front door of hospitals because uh, we know what's happening when, when, when you can't do that. And my last question, is there a shortage or a surplus of these two drugs that you want to use? There's, there, there's no issues with these drugs. Uh, like the hydroxychloroquine, they uh, are, are, have been long since FDA approved. The heparin is only in subcutaneous or injectable form, but in 12 clinical trials in 800 women, uh, 800 patients, excuse me, where it's been tested in burn patients who have lung damage, it's very effective and, and, and very safe. Uh, and the other one is uh, n acylcysteine which is available as a mist um, for uh, pneumonias and for uh, cystic fibrosis patients. All right. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, well, thank you. Ethan, and I love where you're living in Seattle. <laughs> it, it, it's a great place. I appreciate it too.